This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. So the customer's complaining that the walk-in freezer's not working properly and it was like packed full of food. I had to have them move all this crap out of here because it was stacked all the way up. But it's got a giant block of ice back behind the fan motors. And if you come over here, you can see there is just a crap ton of ice. So we're gonna disassemble it. I turned off the condensing unit. We're gonna get this all thawed out. And then uh, the condenser needs to be cleaned too. So we'll get the hose up there. This kind of ice is typical of a door being left open consistently because the defrost is taking care of the ice down below, but the defrost heaters have a hard time getting the ice all on the top. But I mean, we're not gonna rule out refrigeration related, but to me, this looks like a, a door being left open and they actually were having problems with their door closure, so I had to make a repair to it, so. So this is a slow process because I'm in a walk-in freezer and the water wants to run off the back of the coil when I'm trying to melt it. See, I'm trying to do all the work from the front of the coil, but it just keeps running down, so I have to stop because in a walk-in freezer, you want the minimal amount of water on the floor, if any at all. Now this is a tile floor, so we have a little bit more leeway, but if it was a raised floor, an aluminum clad floor, the water gets underneath that, the floor is ruined. It freezes and lifts up, so be very careful. But point I'm trying to make, that's where this wand really comes into play because you have this mist feature and you can just very carefully get in there and break down stuff in situations where it's running down the back. My favorite feature on this guy is the shower feature and that's that. I love that but see it's already starting to drip down the back so it's just a slow process. Even on the tile floor, once the water gets down there, it freezes, it's like an ice skating rink and it's almost impossible. It's a nightmare. So you want the, you know, aim for no water on the floor at all. Like I said, I like to do it all from the front. Okay, so just using steam, just very carefully. And what happens is all the stuff will fall off the back in giant chunks, just whoosh, just falls and releases right off. So if I still got a little bit more to clear, let's go back here and see. No, it actually looks pretty darn good. So the coil is pretty damaged, but we'll just uh, clear the side panels, make sure there's no ice over there, and then we'll put this guy back together. So the condensers aren't horrible, but they're dirty. So I don't think we're gonna need cleaner though. I'm just giving them a quick rinse, get the mud out of them. And then uh, we'll put that, we still gotta put the coil back together. I just wanted to do it before I put the hose away, come up here and rinse everything off. So gotta be careful though, because um, this water will go right through and soak the motors. So you wanna be cautious. I mean, look at the stuff coming out of it. It's nasty. All right, my condensing unit's running now. On startup, the sight glass was flashing, and it flashed for a good three, four minutes, and then it cleared up. Well, that's normal on a walk-in freezer, if everything is working correctly, because the evaporator fan motors do not turn on right away um, until the evaporator gets to a certain temperature. So you want to give it time to stabilize out before you start checking things. Now, I have service gauges on this guy, and... Uh, it's about, let's see, I'll get a thermometer out here. Let's see how hot it is outside. I guess it's about 98 degrees, maybe more. Yeah, 98 and climbing slowly, so it might hit 100. Um, we are running a significantly low head pressure, but my coil is still wet. It's still drying off, so that's to be you know expected. Um, Everything else is looking pretty good. We're running a clear sight glass. Evaporator fan motors are running now. Um, last thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna let it run for about 10 minutes, get the coil nice and cold, and then we're gonna throw it into a defrost and make sure all the heaters are working just for giggles. And uh, yeah, it looks like we're pushing right at 100. So um, it's actually kind of a cool day. Um, yeah, that's looking pretty good so far. You know, I get a lot of questions from people about this valve on the side of this compressor. There's two different styles. This is more of a fixed orifice metering device style, but it is a, uh, uh, it's a valve that helps to cool the compressor off, okay? We can call it a uh, discharge temperature uh, DTC valve. Um, that one's not technically a DTC valve, but it's liquid injection, essentially. So you have liquid coming off the liquid line after it comes out of the condenser, goes through a solenoid that only opens when the compressor is running, and it meters refrigerant into the compressor to try to cool it off. 
when you get high compression ratio situations and really high discharge temperature, they want to try to cool the head of that compressor off, so they're going to inject some refrigerant into there. So it's not pure liquid refrigerant, they're metering it just like an expansion valve. So this one's not a DTC valve, but two different styles. This one's just a fixed orifice device, and then there's a, uh, a DTC valve, which essentially is a temperature responsive expansion valve. It's an expansion valve, non-adjustable, that has a head going into the top of the compressor that you know basically opens and closes. Um, but yeah, so this one just runs all the time whenever the compressor's running. It feeds refrigerant on this one, and it just cools the compressor is all it's doing. So at about 103 is where it's kind of topping out at. We've got about 113 degrees saturation temperature. Uh, it's still a little low. Um, I like to see typically on these micro channel condensers, you'll see about 15 to 18 degrees uh, condensing temp over ambient. So we're getting there. Um, but again, it's going to dry out and it'll start building the head pressure more and more as it comes up. So we're going to go ahead and uh, put this guy into defrost. I'm, I'm happy with the refrigerant pressures and the clear sight glass and everything. So this is our current sensing relay and it just runs one leg of the compressor through it. And whenever it senses power through that leg, it opens that solenoid valve that feeds refrigerant into the compressor. So uh, went ahead and uh, pushed this guy into defrost. So we're going to go downstairs and check all the heaters now. All right, so one heater's at six amps, one heater's at five amps. I'm happy with that, it only has two heaters. This is one end, this is one end, and this is the drain pan heater. So we're gonna put this guy together. Always wanna inspect your limit switches too. I don't see any damage, they look fine. So put it together and uh, tell the customer to keep an eye on it. You know, taking the time to do things right, to do the best in your abilities, to make sure that you fix the problem and or make the customer aware of the problem, right? In this situation, it's just a walk-in freezer that's iced up. Now, I say it's just a walk-in freezer because I deal with these all the time, and we run into iced up walk-in freezers all the time. Now, I have a methodical way of defrosting these, troubleshooting them, and working through the steps. Everybody doesn't have to do it the same, as long as you get to the same end result, okay? Um, and it also depends on your, your customer's habits. My customers have bad habits of leaving the doors open because they're high volume restaurants and it's hard for them to keep the doors shut, okay? Um, there's a lot of reasons behind that, but that's that's a whole bunch of psychological stuff too. But, you know, we we have to make sure that, you know, we go through the process and try not to skip steps that might not get us to the end result that we want, okay? Defrosting the evaporator coil. I personally like using hot water or cold water before I try to use a torch or a heat gun. And in fact, I don't ever use torches because you run the risk of damaging the evaporator coil by heating the aluminum up too high. And then also you have a carbon monoxide risk. In an enclosed space running a torch for a very long time, you can cause some issues and have some breathing stuff maybe pass out. So you want to be very cautious about that. Heat guns. I really don't care to use a heat gun. I find hot water to be the most efficient tool and even cold water to be more efficient than a heat gun personally. But you have to take some steps to make sure that that water doesn't get onto the floor. Like I said, once you get water onto a floor in a freezer, it's one of the worst things to try to get up, okay? Especially if it's a big freezer and the box temperature is really low. See, you could be working in big industrial type freezers where you're in a parka, beanie, all the, the, the cold weather gear, and you're still freezing your butt off, and you're defrosting an evaporator, and if any water drips onto the floor, it's still negative 10 in the rest of that box because you might have multiple evaporators. In my situation, it's a smaller box, so yes, I could prop the door open, but I don't want to unnecessarily bring the box temperature any higher than it needs to be. So it's kind of a game. So I prefer to use water, just take my time as the drain pan starts to fill up or as the water starts to drip off the back of the coil, slow down and just keep proceeding. I still find it to be much faster myself than using a heat gun. Even with the heat gun, you can damage the coil because you can get wires melted and different things like that, okay? I also personally take out the evaporator fan motors as much as possible. There's times that you can't get them out because of the ice and you kind of got to do what you got to do, but I prefer to take them out. Then I go through my process of defrosting it. Again, because I work on these things a lot, I start to notice patterns and trends. The type of ice formation that I saw was indicative of a door being left open in my opinion and the defrost heater is just not running long enough to properly defrost everything okay so yeah we could add more defrost into the system and sometimes i'll do that or we could just tell the customer hey keep the door shut you know 
Also, I didn't ex in, explain it in the video, but I'm also inspecting the closing hardware on the doors. The doors need to be self-closing. If doors are not self-closing on walk-in coolers and walk-in freezers, trust me, they will not get shut. So try to talk your customers into self-closing hardware, making sure that the gaskets are sealing properly. And something that gets forgotten about a lot of the times is vacuum breakers. Make sure that the vacuum breakers are working. A vacuum breaker is something to relieve the pressure inside the box. That way the door doesn't get stuck shut. If you think about it, at your home, domestic home refrigerator, oftentimes if you open your, your refrigerator side, then you shut it, then you open your freezer side, and then you go to try to open your refrigerator side, you'll notice, oh, you can't get the door open. You know, it's because a vacuum has been created inside that box, and it's really difficult to get the doors open. It just takes time. On commercial and industrial walk-ins, we have vacuum breakers, which are little uh, pressure relief devices that typically have a heating element inside of them that help to break the vacuum. You want to make sure that those vacuum breakers are working properly. Okay. So I went through the process. I checked or I defrosted the coil. I inspected the condensing unit. I did take my hoses onto the roof because it was dirty. Again, you don't want to do that in the middle of the summer. And you know, I probably should address this too. This video was from like last year, by the way, last summer. We're currently February 13th of 2022. So it's not a hundred degrees outside yet. We're about 80 degrees, but uh, we will get back to that hundred degree weather here in the next couple months. But um, do you, you know, I mean, I, I cleaned the condenser coil up on the roof. I didn't see the need to go, you know, heavy cleaners or anything, just water worked. And I still inspected everything, put my service gauges on it, watched the system pull down, made sure the pressures looked good. Sight glass was clear, then went and tested the defrost heaters. Defrost heaters have to be working properly. Defrost time clock needs to be keeping time. Went through all that, couldn't find anything else wrong. So we chalked this one off as a potential that the customer was leaving the door open. Now, mind you, like I said, this was from sometime last year. We really haven't had any other problems, I don't think, on this box that I can remember. So, yeah, just a basic iced up walk-in freezer. So I really appreciate you guys making it to the end. If you haven't already, check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. It's just a great way to help support the channel, guys. I talk about this uh, on a recent video, but, you know... Um, content creators, I, I do okay because I do get AdSense revenue, but any extra support does help because personally myself, and I know a lot of other content creators too, we all put a lot of time and effort into these videos. So anything you can do to help, um, the easiest way, in my opinion, to support my channel is literally watch the videos from beginning to end without skipping through anything. Doesn't cost you a single thing. YouTube handles all the, 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 the payment and everything because, you know, you understand what happens if you don't skip anything, right? So um, that's the best way. But if you want to help support other ways, the website, hvacrvideos.com, there's links in the show notes for other methods, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. Uh, those are other great ways to help support the channel. If you're interested in purchasing any tools, you can go to truetechtools.com. I have an offer code, big picture, one word, get you an 8% discount. I get a very small commission from that when you guys use that uh, offer code. And then also, if you shoot me an email and tell me what you're going to purchase, I can generate an affiliate link. You can still use the offer code. I get a little bit more of a commission by that. So I really, really appreciate you all. And uh, we will catch you on the next one. Okay.